to all of you, to you ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy to be taking part in this summit. And I have enjoyed all the great speeches that I have heard today. This is about humanizing globalization, about humanizing all the uh, bringing together the ha hearts and minds. And I have heard some very good things today. I would like to tell you about the effects of internet on the, in the world of politics. and how it has created a great revolution in the world, the internet and technology. That is why in 2010, I nominated internet for a Nobel Peace Prize. And we introduced three people as the fathers of the internet. The Nobel jury, for reasons of their own, decided to choose somebody else, which was also very good, in my opinion, and I totally agree with them. They quite rightly gave the prize to a Chinese dissident, Liu Xiaobo, who is a colleague of mine. We then launched a campaign to free Liu. In any case, we are talking about internet and its importance. Since 2009, you have been witnessing on a daily basis how Islamic countries have started to stage uprisings and to get rid of dictatorship. Why is this happening? And why did none of this happen 10 years ago? The first things dictators do is to exercise censorship. And why do they do that? Because they don't want people to have access to information. They do not want people to interact and to unite. But thanks to internet, people have been provided with opportunities to do so through social networks such as Facebook and Twitter. People in these despotic countries who years ago had no opportunity to interact with each other and with the outside world, were able to do so. Internet effectively ended censorship. So the people in the world became aware of what was happening to their fellow human beings. As a result of which, the dictatorships are being toppled one after the other. It first started in Iran. After the June 2009 presidential elections in Iran, the people took to the streets to protest against the fraudulent 
elections. Millions of people took to the streets. The government started to crack down on these people on a very wide scale, which, is, which was not unpre unprecedented. Iranian authorities had done so before. But this time, the situation was different because our young people were able to use their cell phones to take photographs and to uh, load them on the internet. So within very short period, the people in the world could see what was happening inside Iran. One of those who was killed in these street protests was a young girl called Neda. She was 22 years old. And she was shot dead. And when that happened, used her cell, his cell phone and took a film of how she was shot and her last moments. Where next to Neda, the young girl, her music teacher was screaming, saying, Neda, don't die, stay with us, and Neda died. The footage of that scene shook the world, and it resulted in several resolutions that were endorsed in the United Nations against the Iranian government. And now they're about to appoint a special rapporteur to monitor the human rights situation in Iran. There are some people who wrongly believe that the democracy movement in Iran has ended. No, that is not the case. What has happened is because of the intense state of violence, the people no longer take to the streets because once they do so, they're immediately shot at. They'd be imprisoned or killed. But the protests have not stopped. What has happened is that the forms of protests have changed. And the protesters are using different methods. In fact, the movement is growing on a daily basis. The Iranian people went through a revolution some 32 years ago. And that was followed by an eight-year bloody war with Iraq. The Iranian people are tired of violence, which is exactly why they refuse to take part in violence and take up arms. So the Iranian people are continuing their protests in a peaceful manner. As a result, differences have even emerged among the political elite in Iran, which is weakening the government and uh, strengthening the movement, the democratic movement. The Iranian people did not take up arms as the people did in Libya. The Iranian people continue being imprisoned. They continue being killed. But they continue to remain peaceful and protest in a peaceful manner. Therefore, you can say that to all intents and purposes, the Islamic awakening, the awakening of, sorry, the awakening of Islamic states began in Iran in 2009, and it was from then on that it made its way to the Arab countries. Then it was in Tunisia, we had a young street vendor who set himself on fire in protest against Ben Ali's rule. 
which led to the popular uprising in Tunisia. To abdicate. And since dictators are very fond of their power and they are megalomaniacs, once they uh, lose that power, they often become ill. So Ben Ali fled to Saudi Arabia and obviously. Had the Egyptian people engaged in uprising. And Hosni Mubarak, who couldn't even find a country where they would accept him, went to Egypt, to one of the uh, coasts of Egypt, and he also had a uh, stroke because he personally The people of Egypt and Tunisia quite easily succeeded in toppling their dictators. And the reason for their victory can be ascribed in the first place to the awareness of the people, how, and how it was raised thanks to internet, how the people had managed to unite because of internet. And then in the second place, it was because the West, including the United States, no longer defended these dictators. In the U.S., the White House openly told bin Ali and Husni Mubarak that they should leave power. Then it was the turn of Muammar Gaddafi. Women who were in the opposition. And it was at this stage that NATO decided to intervene. They told Gaddafi to give up power and he refused. The United Nations Security Council decided that Gaddafi should be tried at the ICC International Criminal Court because he is uh, because of acts of genocide. Yet Gaddafi still refused to relinquish. So, consequently, NATO 
Sadly, there is a very horrific war taking place in Libya. On the one side is Gaddafi and his mercenaries, and on the other is the innocent civilians. Now in Syria, for some 50 years, the Assad family have been ruling over the people of Syria. According to the constitution of Syria, the government, the nature of the government in Syria is Republican. But while Hafez Assad was alive, he never left his post as presidency. And when he died, his son, Bashar Assad, took over. The Assad family have been extremely ruthless dictators. After 50 years, the Syrian people have come to become, they have become wise. They are tired, they're frustrated with all these despotism. So they, they've staged an uprising. Syria is one of the close allies of Iran. Bashar Assad has refused to relinquish power. He, to, he has sent tanks to the streets and his um, been killing his own people. And the Iranian government has own people. And the United Nations has twice issued warning against Iran. He's, they've warned Iran, saying, why are you helping Syria kill its people? Syria is a bridge for the Iranian people. It is through Syria that Iran has been sending arms to Hezbollah in Lebanon. So Iran does not want this bridge to collapse. But I promise you here that the Syrian people will be victorious. When a government uses tanks and fires bullets at its people, and yet its people refuse to go home, be certain that such a government will not last, and it will be toppled. After Syria, other dictatorships in the region also staged uprising, including the people in Jordan. But the difference is the king of Jordan was somewhat wiser. And before the people uprising intensified, he took a preemptive action by saying that uh, he would allow the people choose the prime minister, which is something he used to do himself. He used to appoint prime ministers himself. And that pacified the people to some extent. And now there are uprisings in Yemen and in Bahrain as well. Where the people are fighting their respective governments. And all this is taking place. Why? Because of internet. 
Ten years ago, the same dictators were ruling over their people. But nobody said a word in these countries. That is why in these countries, whenever people stage demonstrations, the first things the governments in these countries do is to block internet or to slow down the speed of internet to make it difficult for them to use it. Or they try and block all the cell phones, the mobile phones, so that people cannot contact one another. In fact, the Iranian government has gone a step further, and they have said First, I should point out that in among the Middle Eastern countries, Iran has more progressive technology, hence its government is more powerful. Now, the Iranian government announced recently that it is going to launch a halal or religiously permitted internet. As a Muslim, practicing Muslim, I always used to think the term halal always referred to meat. I didn't realize internet could also be halal. So the Iranian government announced that in the next two months they will launch a halal internet, which means that uh, they are going to block people's access to internet and only provide them for very few networks. And sadly, the Iranian government does have the power to deprive our people of access to internet. Which is why the United Nations about two months ago announced that use of internet is one of the rights of every human being. In other words, if to date it was all about freedom of expression, freedom of education, and uh, and the right to health and the right to legal, just legal representation were parts of the universal declaration of human rights and human rights principles. Now they have also added the right to have access to internet as well. That has also become part of the human rights principles. And a country which blocks its people's access to internet is violating human rights. Now, what is the best way to help these people, these countries, these nations? As I mentioned earlier, internet helps raise awareness among the public to stage uprisings, but it is not enough. Because, as I mentioned, they can block internet. And internet users rely on government servers. So it is not enough. Another point I'd like to hi highlight is that when people become totally frustrated with a situation and stage an uprising, 
Dictators don't relinquish power so easily, like, uh, like Bashar Assad, like Muammar Gaddafi, and that leads to civil war. Now, should we wait for the people to reach saturation point when they can no longer bear this situation and wait for a civil war to happen before we take any action? Can globalization not offer any solutions to avert civil wars in these countries? In my opinion, it can. Now, what is the solution? When we talk about globalization, we see that it is only trade that seems to have become globalized. And the problems of the world today stem from the fact that other issues and concepts have not become globalized. One of these factors is justice, which should enter globalization. Justice must be globalized in order to prevent dictators from uh, their crimes. You know that ICC has, uh, International Criminal Court has existed since 2000, but ICCs can only bring to trial dictators or states that are members or signatories to ICC, and uh, many countries especially non-democratic countries, have not joined ICC. Or the other option for ICC is that the United Nations Security Council could agree to refer the case of a dictator to the ICC. But because in the UN Security Council, the members have the right to veto, the Security Council members reach such con consensus very late to, you know, whether or not to send a dictator to the dictator's case to the ICC, such as the case of the Sudan, when after some 200,000 innocent civilians were killed, and some 100,000 women were raped, it was only then that the UN Security Council agreed to refer Omar Bashir's case to the ICC, or in the case of uh, Gaddafi, they agreed to do so after all these things that have happened. So what I'm trying to say is this. We must do something to save future victims, and we must allow the current victims to have ways to lodge complaints against their dictators. Only when justice becomes globalized, we will witness the gradual, gradual humanizing, humanizing of globalization and how humanity will, human dignity will be 
become important in countries around the world. Human dignity cannot exist without justice, and justice must be globalized. Yes, I understand. I know that in today's world, what you hear from me sound like a mere dream. But please bear in mind that many achievements of humanity began as dreams. Yes, I also have a dream. And my dream is globalization of justice. The challenge before us here today is to think idealistically, yet act realistically. Yes, that is my hope. And I hope that one day we will be able to make this a better world than the world we have inherited from our ancestors and give a better world to our children. Thank you all for listening to me.